So what I'm going to talk about is still really a work in progress. Uh, so unfortunately, I don't have finished products and say, look, at this artist was working with this scientist, and this is what they did. Uh, our first exhibit is scheduled for January, February 2017, and the artists are sort of still conceptualizing what, <laughs> what their projects are, are going to be. So I have some idea of, of what they're going to do, but um, I, I want to talk about the process because I think there's something to be learned about that and also some of the things we've been doing in Austin. So essentially, um, the, the, the idea is really simple, to have artists collaborating with scientists and engineers in a very active way. So there's a lot of activity in the arts, uh, maybe what I would call uh, looking at the artists as users of new technology. So you have some new fancy technology or, or science that's developed, and then the scientist or the artist comes in and kind of uses it and creates art. Uh, and that's kind of interesting, um, but to me, the more interesting thing would be to have the artists actually involved in the research. And uh, a lot of the artists that I've gotten to meet have a lot in common with scientists. I think their process tends to be the same. Artists tend to be makers of things and as well as scientists are. And so bringing them together, I think there's actually a lot of synergy in a way that people don't, don't realize. And the scientists and engineers could definitely benefit from the creative spark that the artists have. And I think also, at least from the interactions I've had with artists, is that the artists benefit from the direct interaction with scientists and engineers, where they're not just being uh, told, hey, here's a product, go use this. The artists are actually informing the scientists and engineers about what that product should be early in the innovation process. And by doing that, ultimately, uh, you know, one of the things I'm very interested in is this business creation aspect. So the project I'm going to talk about so far has almost nothing to do with business creation. It's essentially about bringing artists and scientists together to create new art. That's essentially what, what we're doing. Um, in the long run, though, we're looking at how does art inform scientific progress and then maybe ultimately spark um, business creation and innovation. So my activities really got started through uh, something called an ideas lab that was uh, formed um, as part of the Skolkovo Institute of Technology. So there's a new, a fairly new university that was started in Moscow called Skolkovo Institute of Technology. When they got started, um, they wanted some help, I guess, or advice on how do you start a new university. And so they reached out to MIT and brought MIT in to help them get going. So one of the things that MIT and Skoltech did was put together a, a week-long workshop called an Ideas Lab workshop. And they asked for applications from people all over the world. Um, basically, this was, uh, this was all the information they gave. Uh, how can an institution or government seed grow and maximize technological innovation and entrepreneurship? So this, this wasn't anything really about art and science and engineering. It was just, uh, hey, if, you have a, if you're thinking about innovation and have some creative ideas, apply to this thing, come to Moscow. Uh, and so I went to this the, uh, along with maybe 33 other faculty, I think, were there. There were uh, professors from all over the world, um, a variety of different disciplines. So I think there were maybe a few engineers there, a couple of scientists, but people from economics, business schools, a couple of people from design. There was one artist I'll tell you about. Um, public policy. So it was a very, very diverse range of, of uh, people who were there. And we were there for a week to talk to each other and come up with proposal ideas. Because in the end, um, uh, Skoltech wanted to fund three-year, $1.5 million projects. So everyone who was there was really seriously talking about proposals because in the end you're pitching a proposal that, that may be funded for you know, a fairly substantial amount of money. So uh, they accepted me. Um, I got my visa, went to Russia. Uh, so we were at a hotel across from Red Square. So this was basically uh, the view out one of the windows where we were meeting and having everything. It was a little bit of a surreal experience to be kind of locked, at, uh, not locked, but in a hotel across from Red Square with these random people that I'd never met before from entirely different disciplines talking about, uh, you know, trying to think about as creative ways as possible 
um, to speed innovation. So that's me trying to think of ways to do that. And then I met um, this guy. So this is the artist who I've been collaborating with. His name's James Sham. So James is on the faculty in the art and art history department at George Washington University. And um, when I first met him, I didn't know he was an artist. So we were having a meet and greet, and you get to talk to people. And uh, so I, I was talking to James. So they did these different activities. So, so one of the things they did um, in the ideas lab is they sent out these surveys, and you filled out kind of personality profiles or something like that. And they drew a map of kind of different continents, they had like three or four continents or something. And then they grouped people together. And they said, OK, go talk to people in your continent. Uh, James and I each had an island by ourselves. I don't know what happened, but we didn't even get on a continent. Um, so James and I are like, well, OK, we'll talk to each other. Um, and so I found out James was an artist. And at that time, I had really not much conception of what artists do, actually, I have to say. Uh, and I, my first question to James was, well, what, what kind of art do you do? He says, oh, I'm a sculptor. Later, I find out he really does not like being asked that question. <laughs> he was actually literally teaching sculpture, but he does not make sculpture. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it turns out, you know, I, I'm not sure how to define the art that he does, but he's clearly not a sculptor as you would think of sculptors. Um, so he's a pretty creative, idea, creative guy. Um, so he started talking to me about, you know, one of the things he asked me is, uh, what in science and engineering do you have um, uh, like a fire tower? Okay, <laughs> and I was like, what is a fire tower and what are you talking about? Uh, so the idea is like in your practice in science and engineering, do you have a way of working where you build something, basically you know you're just going to destroy it, but you build it and you learn something in that process, and the idea is not to build it and like keep it and show it and all that, the, the, like the fire tower. So basically you build a building, so like the, you know in this case the firemen go in and uh, practice putting out fires, okay? Um, yeah, I was like, we have nothing like that in science and engineering. Everything I do, I hope, does not get burned to the ground. Um, and what I was realizing is that maybe there's some, um, something to be learned by having a fire tower kind of ex exercise. So as I was um, talking to James and thinking about you know, how at least this one artist thinks and how I think about problems, you start to realize that there might be some things we could learn from each other. So these are some of the things that I do in my research lab. So I was really interested to talk to James. Um, so this is paper made of silicon that we make. Um, so it's the same stuff that your computer chips are made of, but uh, we make it as a fabric. And if you look under the electron microscope, it, it looks, like, um, looks like a felted material uh, or like paper. So uh, paper you write on is made of cellulose fibers that are held together. So in this case, we make fibers of crystalline pieces of silicon and then put them together into a mat. So we have this paper. Um, we can do it with silicon. We can make it with germanium. This is probably the most creative thing my students have made, like a paper airplane out of germanium. Uh, but you know, we really kind of don't know what to do with this stuff. Like we have this semiconductor material; it's flexible. You can fold it. It's lightweight. But then we don't we don't have great idea. I mean, we obviously think of things we could do with it, but we want new ideas. Okay, so this is silicon as you, as we know it, and this is what we make in the lab. So we, so what I've done uh, in my group and with my students is come up with the chemistry to make this material. And the idea is, what do you, what do, you do with it? Um, and some people have gotten really creative thinking about what you could do with it. So the Discovery News um, has a little blog. One of the writers um, read one of our papers and wrote this article on tissue paper that could stop bullets and harness solar energy. Who wouldn't want a shirt that could stop a bullet and power your iPod? A new fabric can do just that. So like, that's pretty creative. Um, some writer thought of that idea, and it's not completely unrealistic. Um, what, this is another example of a material that we're making in my lab. It's an ink that we can spray paint on surfaces and make solar cells. And um, so this is the process. We've developed the chemistry for this ink. We actually make solar cells. 
And this is kind of the embodiment of what, what we're doing. And then when you start to think about, well, is that really how you need a solar cell to work? Does it have to be a big, giant panel of glass that's heavy and, and brittle? Um, and if it doesn't have to look like that, you know, what could you do with it? And so start thinking about uh, portable power applications and things like that. And materials. So when I was talking to James, I was very interested to really understand is there, you know, would we be able to work together and come up with new ideas and maybe more creative ideas uh, than we already um, were doing, okay? So could we, could we do that? And there's also a practical reason I was very interested in that. And so this is one example of an experience I went through. Uh, this is one company that I started in 2001 called the Novalite, and uh, we started out doing lighting with silicon nanocrystals, and then that uh, we're, wasn't working so well. We were competing with uh, white OLEDs and high brightness LEDs and realized we're never going to make it to market before that, uh, and then thought, what do we do with this stuff? Change directions to solar panels. So this company, Novalite, uh, ended up being bought by DuPont for $70 million in 2011, but it was a 10-year journey, and they had raised like $65 million. So it was bought for a large number, but also a lot of money was put into it. And in reality, it would have been a lot better to shrink this 10 years into three and also raise less money and make more money. Okay, so that's the idea. Is there some way that you can get around this uh, and do it faster? And so um, one of the first ideas that James said to me, which um, there's no commercial value in this, but I'm just going to throw it out there because suddenly I realized, wow, you know, James does not think like me, <laughs> I would say. Uh, so he saw this, this ink, and he was like, oh, you know what you could do with this? You could uh, package it as spray paint cans, put it in a local... Um, hardware store and put it like on the bottom shelf or something and then kind of let um, hoodlum kids come in like gangsters come in and like steal it and then they'd take it to their neighborhood and spray paint a bunch of stuff some graffiti and then you would track it and find out where they spray painted and then you would hook up their graffiti and make the solar cells out of it so then you'd have little power generation sta stations in their in their home neighborhood and um, I thought that was really interesting. I was like, wow, I had never thought of that before. Um, there are a lot of technical hurdles with, with doing that and wiring it up. But, um, but that's part of what you start thinking about when uh, an artist comes in and you start thinking about what are the social implications of what you're doing. So uh, where you're not constrained by you know, what the National Science Foundation is telling you you need to do or by a commercial reality. So this was another guy who was at the Ideas Lab, Adam Bach. So James and I were talking, got really interested in this, and then we realized if we really wanted to do like the innovation part, the speeding innovation part, connecting back to business, we really needed someone who knew about that aspect. And Adam uh, was a senior lecturer um, at the University of Edinburgh Business School. And he went through a similar um, experience to me where he was uh, uh, CEO of a, a startup company where they were trying to take this technology that was on the cover of Nature, uh, where they had made these structures that mimicked um, gecko feet, and they had a really interesting science and technology, but you know didn't quite know what to do with it. They didn't really know what the the commercial business was, and they went after a few things, and and none of that really worked, and eventually they um, went out of business. So Adam was thinking, well, how do you, again, how do you take some fundamental thing that's happening in the lab and get to that commercial success in, in a rapid way? How do you avoid these innovation inefficiencies? Um, so we proposed this project to Skoltech to combine art, science, and business. So it was the three of us, me, James, and Adam, uh, proposed a project called Rapid Design Pivot. And so in a startup company, what you really want to do is you pick an application, 
uh, or a path towards commercialization, and you want to find out as quickly as possible whether that's going to be viable. Um, and if you find out it's not going to work, it doesn't mean you're out of business. It just means uh, hopefully you do that before you run out of money, then you pivot, and then you still have some money, and then you try to make progress so you can eventually raise more money and keep going. So um, there are a lot of concepts we talked about in terms of startups in, in Moscow. One is like uh, for, for uh, entrepreneurs need to not be afraid of failure and actually embrace it. So if failure doesn't mean, again, your company's going out of business. It just means you need to find out as quickly as possible if that idea is really a viable idea so that you can pivot to something else if it's not. So that was our concept is how do we speed that pivoting process? Okay, and how do we, can we use artists, inject artists into the process, the innovation process, the science and engineering process to speed the pivoting? Okay, or to even create more pivots than, than, than you expected before. So things like can you get people involved in the process that can think of the outlier technology that's like out there by itself? How do you, how do you figure that out? Okay, so who can come up with outlier ideas? And then how do you speed the process of, of pivoting uh, through the injection of art? So, um, so, so that was a, the concept of the project. Um, what James and I did then was um, try to bring artists and scientists uh, together. Okay, and, um, and that you know, worked out pretty well. This is an example. So the kind of artists we brought in the process. Uh, people who, who make things um, have a track record of doing that and have made some interesting objects. So this is um, some work by Patrick Killoran. And so Patrick made one uh, object called the glass outhouse. So you can basically sit in the outhouse and do your business. And then you can look out and see outside, but no one can see in. Uh, and apparently, there are companies that are interested in this sort of thing. Um, now and commercializing it, but um, at the time no one had sort of thought of this concept or had made it before. Um, so Patrick's a really interesting kind of soft-spoken guy. Uh, he, he's very uh, clean cut and kind of strikes you as a businessman until you start talking to him more and you realize, oh yeah, this guy is an artist for sure. Um, and so, he, you know, he was saying that he's been kicked out of several ex exhibitions. I was like, you got kicked out? Like, your, your work's real controversial. Uh, and he says, this piece has got him kicked out of more exhibits than any other one. And I was like, why is that? Uh, and he said, because it's supposed to be used. Like, so the point of the art is like, uh, he basically doesn't want this outhouse sitting in a gal, this uh, whatever, the porta potty, sitting in a gallery and everyone just sort of inspecting it and looking at it. Like part of the art is like it's supposed to be used. So it's supposed to be like on the sidewalk as a functional porta potty. And the galleries were like, you can't do that. <laughs> it's like a piece of art that someone's going to buy or something. So, and Patrick's just like, well, then you, can, you know, we won't show it. And he pulls it. So, uh, so that, I'm like, that's the perfect kind of guy for this project. Um, this is um, work from Daniel Boschkoff, another artist. Um, so he, these are two of his projects I just highlight up here. One uh, just called Yogurt Reinforced with DNA. Um, so he uh, essentially cloned himself into the strand of yogurt bacteria or something. So I guess a, there's a part of Daniel in each one of these containers of yogurt. Um, but he is, you know, when he talks about this project is fascinating what the thought process were that, that went into it. He was actually working in a microbiology lab learning how to do the DNA, um, recombinant DNA technologies and, and make this. But, you know, some of the reasons that he was really interested in this project had uh, more to do with the underlying um, ethics of genetic uh, engineering and some of the things that were happening in France related to the Human Genome Project and how oh, this is French DNA versus other DNA. And he's like, oh, that's interesting. There are a lot of questions. Uh, if Daniel was here, he could tell you all about it. But there's a technology component to this that is pretty fascinating. Um, this is another project that he did, I think, for the Turkish Millennial is what it was. 
um, where he did a project where he was trying to create a perfume that smelled like Ernest Hemingway, or how er this is called Eau de Ernest. And so uh, he went to Cuba, like this, um, this uh, gathering of Ernest Hemingway lookalikes, and went around and talked to them and said, what do you think Ernest Hemingway smelled like? You know, and they were all like, basically it was like, he, he, it was really musky. It was a really musky scent. So then, um, then uh, Daniel Wen, he had to find like a perfume designer who could create this scent. So he actually, you know, created this Eau de Ernest. And when he was talking to the perfume designer, he would tell her, yeah, it needs to smell like this. And she would be like, no, you, you can't, can't do that, or uh, you know, no one's designed scents that smell like that. And so she had to create some new types of aromas for this Eau de Ernest. Um, and so in that process, the perfume design designer herself was growing as a, you know, in her practice. Uh, and then it led to a whole bunch of things. So Daniel created this. Um, Perfume. One of the major department stores in Istanbul wanted to carry it as their line of the year, and the Ernest Hemingway Foundation got upset and was going to like sue him to do it. So then he had to look for a different way to sell this stuff, and uh, kind of, from what I understand, created went to some black market perfume creators in Bulgaria to like create this black market version of of Eau de Ernest. And so it's like, so there's all of these really interesting aspects to me um, that could, if you put that guy in a science lab, like, he, you know, what's going to come out of it? Like, I want to see what's going to happen. Um, this is another guy, Stephen Brower. So Stephen, he's an, another New York City artist. So Patrick, Daniel, and Stephen are all from New York City. Um, and so Stephen's this uh, really interesting guy. Uh, he's, a, he's an artist who went to Pratt. Um, he's an artist, but he has this interest in creating things that um, have a tie to technology. So, like, he, he made this spacesuit. So, he, like, uh, dug up the, the old designs for, from NASA for, like, the spacesuit for the person who walked on the moon, and he just, like, replicated it. Like, <laughs> made that. Um, the first lunar lander, he... Um, Again, went and got the design, like some, some obscure place in the library or something, and then created the lunar lander that landed on the moon and, and showed it out there. Um, so S Stephen does these really interesting projects, and he's another artist. And this is James, James Sham. So one of the things James is doing is he's actually um, doing research in my lab, and one of the things he's making are solar rocks, so these photovoltaics on rocks, and he has an idea for this art project that involves this. And um, James has had to work with some of my PhD students. And what's been really interesting to, for me to see over the past year or so, what James inserted in the process is to see how James's creativity is rubbed off on my students. Um, so just on this trip, um, my two, actually an undergrad and one of my PhD students were sending tweets about, um, all these solar things they're making. So they did like a solar water bottle, solar stickers, solar wristband and everything. And they had these videos they were sending me. And I was like, wow. Uh, one of the students, no way would he have been doing that a year ago. He had been in the lab making like his next chemistry move and trying to get higher efficiencies. But now he's doing things that are, that are really more connecting with society. And I think James has a lot to do with that. Um, so this is, this is one of the things that James is doing. So in this project, uh, we had money for about a year. We got um, these guys, along with a few other artists involved in the process. We actually went to Moscow, started talking with scientists in Moscow about things. Uh, had a couple of workshops, both in Moscow and at UT, where we brought in the artists and had them talk about their art process, but then also uh, some things going on related to art and science. And so that lasted about a year. And then uh, some things happened in Russia, like the fall of the ruble um, and some internal things at Skoltech. And then our project was cut, So, which was kind of unfortunate because we were fine, you know, we had spent a lot of time getting it going. Uh, but then that distance between Austin and Moscow, and there was 
there was actually a lot of tension because I think in uh, Skoltech, there were half of the deciders who really liked our project and the other half that were like, what are they doing? <laughs> Why are you giving them money? Um, and so it was really split, I think, and we felt that. You know, you, we would go to Moscow and talk to you know, the faction that loved us and then talk to the faction that hated us or didn't understand us. They did not understand what we were doing. Uh, and so it was almost better just, okay, well, you know, we're going, we're going to do our own thing. So U UT has given us um, a little bit of money, essentially, to finish out our first exhibit, uh, which we're calling Omnibus Filing. So um, I told James that my first patent was something called an Omnibus Patent, which had like 650 claims. It was a lot. It was basically like I had a te base technology materials that we had created, and then we we're thinking, what can we do with this? And we had a whole bunch of ideas, didn't really know. So we filed this massive patent called an omnibus filing. And the USPTO now does not like omnibus filings, omnibus patents. Um, but they're really great. So, uh, so we're thinking, um, OK, well, what's our exhibit going to be? I don't know. <laughs> it's going to be a whole bunch of stuff, for sure. So uh, we're calling it Omnibus Filing, and these are the, the four artists. We're actually trying to find somebody to bring in another artist or two. But so this is the, the, um, the rapid design pivot model, or innovation arts, as we're thinking about it. I mean, we're really kind of thinking we're, we're um, heading towards trying to create a new, a new field. Okay, a new line of inquiry. How do you how do you do research? Okay, do you have the 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 students who are trained as specialists in science and engineering, and the students who are trained as specialists in art or design, or you do take these students and teach them, you know, the key elements of each of those, but then teach them how to be in the middle. Um, and so I think there's a way to do that, and that's one of the things we're looking at. So. Um, you know, bringing artists, creative outliers, the science and technology, maybe bring entrepreneurs. This entrepreneur thing hasn't worked so well. Every time we start talking to real business people, they're, they're automatically wanting to know, how am I going to make money? <laughs> it's like, don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. And I think the process itself needs to work its way so that you, you have these objects come out before someone starts coming in and saying, no, you can't do that. You know, we really, you have to have the freedom and the flexibility. So I think the right kind of entrepreneur could be great for the process, but we, we really haven't found the right kind of entrepreneur so far. So um, the outcomes of our, our um, project here is really art. Um, maybe then some of these would turn into prototypes that could lead to startups, but we're really kind of focused on the art. And, um, but one of the very first products is probably going to be a scientific paper. So on some of the solar stuff that James has done with, with one of my students, he's been working in a lab of a botanist making nanocellulose or bacterial cellulose fibers, and they make paper out of this stuff. And uh, that paper is uh, very, very smooth because the cellulose fibers are so thin. And you can make these incredibly flexible photovoltaics on, on that kind of paper, uh, which you can't do on regular paper and also is difficult to do on plastic. And so we're, um, in the, uh, we're writing up that paper. And so we'll have actually a scientific publication from this. And so James is super excited about that. He's like, I'm an artist with a scientific publication eventually. So those are, those are some of the, um, the outcomes to this. In the end, how do you, you know, is our process going to remove innovation and efficiencies? I mean, we, this is an experiment, so we, we don't entirely know uh, if it will or not, but it's certainly going to create more innovation, I think. Um, so that's rapid design pivot. So instead of proof of concept to prototype, shop to multiple industries, real world uh, testing. You do proof of concept prototype, or this is some of the research. Then you have this exploratory, cross-disciplinary creative process, so where the artists are actually doing research. They're, they're doing art, OK? But you have, um, you have them involved actively in the research process. 
And so that's been pretty, pretty interesting. So in terms of the, the UT Portugal program, I mean, I, I think this is uh, really new. I mean, it's not new for artists to use new technology. I mean, that happens and it will happen. And if you look at a lot of the art, science-y types of programs that are being created at universities, it's all around that model. It's like put artists in a room and give them a catalog with like really cool tech to buy. Um, that's OK, that's fun and what have you, and some neat arts coming out of that for sure. But I think going a step beyond that, put the artists and the scientists and engineers in the same room to talk about what are the research questions. And really interesting art's going to come out of that for sure. Um, but I think new, new lines of research are going to come out of that as well. So that's, um, that's really the goal uh, of our project. And then seeing what happens with it. Do you end up speeding innovation? Um, or not, and and I think I think we will. I think it's going to work. So maybe UT Portugal um, with the digital media and the creative folks. I mean, every time I'm in Portugal and I'm talk, learning more and more about it. I mean, I think there's this create creativity in Portugal that if we could just harness somehow in this program and bring emerging technology together with digital media, it would be really really exciting. So anyway, so, I, so that's all I wanted to say. And then I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have about the process or how can we do it here or, or whatever.